today, and I hope it's been nice wherever you are as well. Um, so maybe just a quick introduction about what is the SND. Um, the SND is stands for the European Foundation for Management Development, but actually it's an international nonprofit membership organization that is dedicated to the management development um, and is an accreditation body for business schools, business school programs, and corporate universities. And what I want to talk to you a bit more today is, once again, how learning plays a role in transformation. And for those of you who saw my video and already saw my Dave Letterman-like beard, um, what we always hear when organizations start transformation is there's you know two key tools that they always talk about leveraging. One is digital and the other is agile. I think learning plays a really important role as well in the transformation of organizations because it's about building skills and capabilities. So why are organizations transforming? And to a lot of you, this might seem like stating the obvious, but I think it's important um, for us to at least have a common view and foundation for our discussion. Um, in, in the past, there was a very production-focused view within organizations, and I think a lot of us know about this. And you know, the heroes were General Electric and people like Toyota, and it was all about things like Six Sigma and Lean and it making the, the process flow go really, really well. Um, so that was what we refer to as being a production focus. And now everyone has become consumers obsessed. And a lot of that is around um, the, the digital transformation. And when people think about digital enterprises, you know, they often think that it's digital that's in the lead, but actually digital is the tool that they're leveraging. And what's really in the lead is their extremely strong customer focus. And there we see things like Amazon, um, which of course has had a huge boom with the pandemic, um, as well as, as Google. So really putting the customer in the center and driving um, value to that customer, being obsessed with them. And that customer experience that they're trying to create, you know, once again, the three key tools that they're leveraging are digital, agile, and continuous learning. And if you look at those organizations, they all have those three key components that they focus on. So, you know, what is that challenge in creating that customer experience. Um, and this is what, I mean, if any of you have heard of the Mars Innovation Group that is out, um, out of Toronto, Ontario, um, and is a startup incubator for the province of Toronto, what they talk about is um, intelligent enterprise. And they make this distinction between moving from what we would call a digital enterprise to an intelligent enterprise through the focus not just being on digital and the customer experience, but the focus also being very much so on the employees and the employee and spirit experience. And that has to do with driving a consistent customer point of view. And to do that, and this is why I love that slide, you know, it's not just about creating a digital customer experience through digital, it's about also creating that same experience through your employees. So what we're really talking about here is rethinking work as augmented human intelligence. So, um, and, and this is where you often see, and we had this challenge, and I worked with this when I was CLO of Nordea, of, you know, you create a great digital experience on one side for your customers, but then that can fall short on the touch points that, that happen with the employees. And a good example of this was, you know, we put into place these great digital systems for our customers to connect with the bank. But then what happened is when they had the employees and they wanted that personal touch, um, the employees didn't have access to those same systems. So they weren't seeing what the customers saw, which then created a disjointed customer experience that generated frustration. So the idea of augmented human intelligence is really using that, that machine activity and that digital power to give more power 
to the people um, so that they can then pull through on this customer experience um, and, and create something that's much more holistic. Um, and I think, you know, this is what organizations are focusing on so strongly today is how do you create that seamless experience that makes customers want to come back? So, you know, what does this mean for L and D? Well, L and D has a big role to play, but as a, a, a survey that was done through the, um, Harvard business school, um, review, Harvard Business Review, sorry, corporate learning is recognized as key to growth and talent development, but big however here, in their survey, only 20% of business leaders were satisfied with the learning function's performance, um, and 50% of line managers believe that performance would not change if L&D were, or corporate learning were eliminated, which is a pretty damning statement um, because I think we have a real role to play. And then across the globe, few members even believed that their company was effective at talent development. And when they did, you know, the result of all of this is often learning is thought of as a cost rather than an investment that's being made in people. And when that happens, then learning is often, you know, cut, restructured, repositioned, shifted around the organization. And the, the cause of this, when they've dug further, is that learning and development is also seen as being very focused on a process rather than the outcome of that process. So just as organizations are becoming obsessed with looking at customer experience, learning and development needs to be set obsessed with working hand in hand with business to create business outcomes. That, then you put processes behind that. But you know, it, it, it's it's the whole horse and cart analogy. We need to make sure that we're putting the horse, the results, and the outcomes before the cart, which is the process that's been in place. So. What does this mean? Well, what I'd like you to all think of is, you know, think of learning as a value wheel or a value chain. And I put it as a wheel because I think that it actually creates a virtuous circle. And if you look at that, you know, all organizations have value chains um, and learning has its value chain as well that follows the same steps as a corporate learning or a corporate value chain. So, you know, you're going to start by looking at the strategy of the learning organization. So what is it that you're supporting, you're supporting and what is it you're going to do? And this is really about aligning learning to the business strategy. And at the Organizational Learning in Action Program at IMD, this is something that we pull the participants on. And what's always really surprising is that, you know, at IMD, what we actually do is we go out into the press and in public documents and we pull together, you know, what is the organization saying about its strategy to the outside world? And one of the things that is always fed back by the participants from learning and development is, wow, that's amazing how much information is actually out there. And it's not that hard to figure out both you know, externally from what's available and what we have internally about the organizational strategy and what they're doing. But then the trick, and this is always an eye opener to the participants, is then when you ask them to take a step back and look at what is it they're spending their time on? What is it that their strategy within learning is? And how is that aligned to the organizational strategy? There's always an aha moment and an eye opener moment when they realize, oh, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing that is actually not supporting the organizational strategy. Some of it is bread and butter that needs to be done, but it always leads to the question is, are we spending our time in the right places? So you start really looking at the, the learning strategy that you want to put in place to support the organization. And then from there, you define what is your target market. So, or your target markets. 
Um, so who is it that you're delivering your learning to? How do you segment that market? Who are they? Where, what does their day-to-day look like? Just as a consumer goods company would do to their markets. Um, so really trying to get under their skin and understand, you know, who are those markets that you're targeting and what does their day-to-day look like? And then what is the offer that you put into place to those target markets? Based on that offer, what are your learning resources that you have in place to support them? And here, those resources, I often think, is an ecosystem. So it could be resources that you have within your own team, but it could also be resources that you draw on from external organizations that might be you know, anything from a partner that you work with very strategically to also a supplier that contributes to you being able to deliver your offer. And then finally, you look at the impact. You know, what is the impact that you have? So based on the strategy that the organization had in place, how is learning pulled all the way through to actually be able to help them drive an impact to that business objective that they had? Um, so this might sound complicated, and we've gone through it in a logical order, but I would also say to you, the good news is you can actually start working in any one of these areas. And the more that you reinforce any of these areas to be able to demonstrate impact, then the greater your alignment to the organization strategy will be and the more trust you will gain within the organization for learning. So um, now if, if we look at and zoom in on some key components of this, so one of the things when we're talking about learning and development that is really, really important is that we need to look at this holistic. Talk about holistically, I'm talking about that from you know two different angles. One angle is you know the learning and development that you need to think about is both formal and informal. And this is the famous 70-20-10 where you know we say that actually 70% of learning happens on the job, 20% happens through coaching, mentoring, um, and you know through discussions with colleagues, and then 10% actually happens through informal learning. So within learning and development, I think you know you you see a lot. There's there's a strong focus on the 10%, but that 10% is important, but you also need to focus on the 20 and the 70. And to do that, so if you're trying to create that holistic environment, it means that learning and development needs to work with other centers of excellence or expertise within the HR to actually make sure that, you know, how are all of the different people processes aligned? Um, And that, you know, goes right through the overall people value chain, um, which starts with recruitment and, you know, recruiting the profiles that the organization needs and that is not able to develop internally. Um, How does that pull through to performance management? So the day-to-day of people's um, activities within the organization and how they perform, how do you actually develop them? And that development, I mean, this is where talent often comes in and we talk about talent development. Um, And this is often very important because this is where you can give people experiences um, that will help them develop and grow them through actually things like working on projects or taking a temporary assignment or being promoted into an area for a period of time that that is outside of the area that you've been working in to give you a more broad um, background. And then finally, you know, promotion or exit. Um, So, you know, allowing people to step up and grow and take on more responsibilities within the organization or, you know, potentially exit and, you know, grow and seek new opportunities elsewhere. So how well do those things align? You know, and, and once again, if I if I look at the role that I had as the chief learning officer in Rodea, you know, I spent a lot of time working on this and making sure that, you know, we could get these different pieces aligned. And how did we embed learning, for example, into the performance management process and make that a part 
you know, of that, you know, and that was about, you know, the 20%, you know, making sure that managers, when they were talking about performer man- performance management, also helped their their team understand how they could learn and grow through the activities that they were doing. Um, so, th- so this was very important. And I think here, um, another thing that springs to my mind is that a lot of professional services firms, you know, they're actually quite good at this. You know, they, they, they align these different processes very, very well in giving, you know, through recruitment, performance management, development, and, and promotion or exit. And I think that they're, you know, they're always a good reference. You know, so if you're thinking to yourself, you know, but how do I do this and where do I start? I mean, you can find a lot of good practice that is within professional services industries. And then finally, you know, when you're looking at those overall activities, those holistic activities, you know, it's also asking yourself, how well do they reflect, you know, what the organization needs today? So to operate and do its day to day, and what is it that they need for tomorrow? Um, And I will come back to this in a moment when I get to, I see that the poll is up. So we're going to give you a minute. So once again, five is where you think we are really aligned and we're doing really, really well. And, you know, these things really operate together. And we think about informal and formal learning and how those things come together. One would be if you feel everything is very disjointed or people, you know, once again, take it from the employee's perspective. How do they live that on a day-to-day basis? Do they see how those things work? Right. We have the poll up, Stephen. Can you see this uh, poll? I can that see the poll. All right. And I've got a little message telling me that I cannot vote. so i'm counting on everyone else because i'm actually interested in seeing how you think things your organization is okay great um so looking at the results actually you know these results i feel are quite okay. So we do have um, 16% of you that actually think that you're doing a a really good, you know, a a better than average job, shall we say. Um, Three, of three, um, we've got 47%. So there's like a firm group there in the middle that, I mean, some things are working right and that's great. It means you've got a foundation to build on. And then some others where, okay, you feel like, you know, you've got some work to do, 35%. But, um, you know, once again, I think that's the the good news there is that, you know, I'm I'm a very optimistic person. (laughs) So you can really start jumping in and looking to see, okay, where do you where can you add value? So thank you for sharing that. Um, And let me just move back then to. The presentation. Are you able to see my screen again? Yes, I can see your screen. Perfect. Um, So now let's take a look at digital, one of the other key levers. Um, But I want to take this from the point of view of digital and how you're using digital within learning and development within your organization. And I think, you know, and this is once again, you know, we can pull this looking at digital through the learning value chain. Um, And the first area, you know, in the strategy area is, you know, your digital strategy within your learning and how that actually aligns to your digital strategy um, within the organization. And I think this is really, really important to understand. And I often say, you know, I think there are you know, two key functions that learning and development wants to be absolute best friends with um, as far as getting their job done. 
And those functions are, you know, IT slash digital. And I think, you know, we saw that in the pandemic is that, you know, you need to be able to have digital systems in place to support learning and development, which means you need the support of IT and the slash digital within your organization. And they need to understand what you're trying to do and understand the role that they play in supporting you in that. Um, and the second function is finance, because always, you know, digital and digital systems always come at a cost, which means they need to be in somebody's budget somewhere. It might be in your budget. It might be in the IT budget. It might actually, you know, be in in another budget, in the HR budget, but it's, it's budgeted somewhere. So finance needs to understand what it is that you're doing as well with these systems and how they will be paid for. And I think here, you know, I often think of a story once again, when um, I went to Nordea and we were putting the place, the function there. And when I came in, you know, one of the things and this was being able to drive data. So this was about um, using digital tools and getting our digital tools in order and be able to have data that we could share with the business. Um, and, you know, when we looked at what was in place, we actually had at least, at least four learning management systems with data scattered all over the organization. And, um, there, you know, the, the first thing that, you know, the team and I started talking about is we need to bring able to bring our data together and we need to have a repository or that either they linked up, but we needed to have one place where we could go and have a consistent set of data. Um, and in doing that, you know, I knew from working and being good friends with IT um, that our environment within Nordea, Nordea was an SAP and success factors environment. So when the team started to think about okay, what tools do we want to use to bring our data together? That discussion was very, very fast because we knew that the only support we would get from the IT organization is if we went with an SAP and success factor solution. So that's what we did. Um, and I didn't think much more about it than that because all learning management systems, they all have their upside, they all have their downside. But they, you know, it, you don't want to spend a lot of time, or at least I found, spend a lot of time arguing or convincing people outside of learning what systems that you wanted to use. But it was much easier and much faster to align our digital strategy in learning with the digital strategy that was within the organization. This then, you know, would allow us to better manage the data and analytics. Um, put into place, you know, the use of digital tools. We were also a Microsoft environment. So, you know, we, for better, or for worse, you know, we did almost all of our virtual learning used Teams because that had been rolled out within the organization. Um, and that is a lesson that I, I learned as well. Um, when you're trying to look for tools that you can use with participants, you know, it's once again, putting your shoe, yourself in the shoes of your target markets. Are there tools that they're already using that learning can tap into? Um, so how do you adapt to their environments and the environments that they're using? Um, now, if they don't have a tool, then, okay, you can then look at which tools and how you might want to approach that. But the key thing is, you know, from the shoes of your target audience, are there things that they already have? I think all of us experience this, um, you know, when all of a sudden there's a new tool we need to use, we think, oh, gosh, another tool. Um, so this is where it's always good to put ourselves in the shoes of our participants or our target markets. And if there's a tool that they use and that they're happy with, okay, how do we tap into that? How do we use that digital tool within learning? Um, expertise in systems and resources or systems and processes. And once again, you know, whether it was in my experience in you know, Alcatel, Capgemini or, or Nordea, you know, how do you have people with digital expertise on your team? 
Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, that they have to be, you know, IT experts, but they're people that have expertise in the systems. They understand the value we're trying to drive out of these systems. Um, and they're excited about technology. And how do you make sure that you've got that expertise in your team? Um, and then finally, how do you demonstrate impact with the data? And I think, you know, once again, this is really, really important. And I think, you know, an example of this, once again, from my Nordea days, it was, I was, you know, amazed that when we sat down and we did get our data together, that was an exercise that took over a year and a half to actually bring all of the data together and get it in a, in a workable good data manner because it's the old adage garbage in garbage out so we had to make sure that all of the data was good data that was being put in but we were able to go back to that question that i referred to earlier is you know we were able to show the business how much they were investing in the skills and capabilities we needed for today compared to investing in developing the skills and capabilities we needed for tomorrow. And I think there, you know, we were able to have some real eye-opening conversations with executives where we were able to show them that, you know, less than 10% of what was being invested in some areas of the business was being invested to develop new skills and capabilities. I mean, this absolutely opened their eyes and created some really, really good discussions and some good messaging that then was able to come out to the executives back to the people in their business about the skills and capabilities that they needed to be developing. So, you know, once again, we were able to, going back to showing an impact, showing a result that then showed the business that we were working with them. It helped us gain, gain credibility and helped us, you know, move forward in our learning value wheels. Um, so there's an example of, of digital and how it, pull, how it pulls through the reel. So now it's again a scale from one to five, where you know five you would think we're really good. We know how to pull this through. We've got good digital systems. Um, and to to one where you know we're really struggling the environment is very disjointed and it's hard for us to be able to pull together statistics and data for the business Okay, are we getting our votes in? Super. Here's the results. Ooh, a little less good on digital, um, I see, than you know, than we see and than we saw before on the uh, holistic picture. So only five percent think they're doing a really good job here, and I take a minute here just to say congratulations because this is a, a really important one and not an easy one to crack so i'm glad to see that you know well 30 percent of you um are doing you know better than average or five percent doing really well 28 percent in the middle okay but here you know the big one is that here we've got you know 43 percent of you that are struggling in this area so um you know, once again, this is a really good one then to start thinking about. And, you know, my experience here has, has shown that if you're in that bottom part, let's really make sure that you've got some people that are, you know, both have skills and capabilities and that are excited about digital and want to help you think about how you introduce this into the L&D landscape. But, you know, the good news here is, once again, you can start in any of those areas and it will help reinforce. And the key thing is, you know, trying to look at how you do digital to be able to show business that you're supporting them by getting impact. So if we go back to the presentation um, again, and I will open my presentation. Let me know when you can see it on your screen. Yes, it's visible. Great. Great. 
so here we are, and you see I keep coming back to this learning value wheel, um, and this time looking at it through Agile. <laughs> Let's look at it through the Agile um, view. And here, you know, it's all about on, on the strategy side, you know, how quickly can you adjust priorities, um, you know, and in your markets, are you able to actually anticipate needs? So things that they haven't expressed necessarily yet, but, you know, you've seen that these things will be coming to the forefront. You know, how well do you use analytics in your offer? to be able to see, you know, what are people picking up on? How much do they use it? You know, where are you getting real traction? And what are areas that you might need to be focusing on to either retire or renew? Um, are you able to adapt your operations and business model? And then, you know, once again, an impact, how do you demonstrate contributions? And I think, you know, Agile here, I mean, all of us, have had this test. And I think that, you know, what we've been through in the last year, you know, with COVID um, and countries going into lockdown and people having to work from home and, you know, everything being pushed virtual, um, as we've all seen and heard and, you know, read about. I mean, COVID did more for advancing digital than, you know, who knows how many transformation programs that have been able to do in the past. Um, because, and the good news is, you know, we're really adaptable and, you know, we did swing and we did make things happen. Um, and I think this was the ultimate test of how agile were we when faced with a real constraint that this time, you know, coming from the outside, how well were we able to readjust all of our priorities? You know, how were we able to move things to digital? You know, how did we scramble to still get things done compared to just having to stop things because we didn't have a way of doing it? Um, so, I, you know, I think that was the ultimate test of agility and it was a real eye opener i think from all of us but i think as well you know the the agility here um you know we need to think about in in other examples that we have with the business and showing that we're close to them and you know i share a little story here from my cap gemini days where we had one of our business areas and they had been planning a you know, 300 person physical international event, um, bringing all of their, you know, 300 top managers and high potentials together for a, um, a week of, of talking about the business, the direction that it was going, um, having learning injected into that, uh, what we called a learning and mobilization event. Um, and this was planned for Q3, and H1 results were really bad. And I remember getting a call from, you know, the executive that was leading that business area. And he said, you know, I'm really sorry, Stephen. I know we've done a lot of work on this and then your team has put a lot of effort into it, but we're going to cancel the event. And I remember saying to him, no, you know, we, we can't do that. <laughs> and, you know, we're going to convert this into a virtual event. And the really good news here is that, you know, we'll be able to reach even more people and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll completely rethink the design, we'll completely do it. And I remember the business leader being really taken aback and even a bit skeptical about, you know, how will we be able to achieve those things, you know, to only at the end of once we deliver this and we'd reached more people than we'd ever reached before, um, through this, you know, this virtual learning and mobilization event um, with great feedback scores that I remember the, the, the business area leader actually saying to the CEO, like how amazed he was about how, you know, the, the, the learning team, um, we were a corporate university, how we had actually used this to help them 
um, achieve you know momentum and results and capability building. So it, it can be examples like that as well. But you know this agility and building this agility into your system. Um, another little anecdote was adapting the operations and business models. You know we had a business model within Capgemini that you know you paid. Um, to send people on learning programs. So those budgets were held within the business areas, when even far down in the business areas, they were in department budgets. And, you know, when we hit some hard times um, and, you know, there was a lot of cost reduction involved, there were some key areas that we knew we needed learning to continue with. And we negotiated that those learning programs, the budgets got shifted that, you know, the the tuition wasn't then paid for at the department level because they were all under a lot of pressure and getting cut, but they were then paid for out of a more central pot so that there would not be any barriers to that learning continuing because that learning was absolutely key still for the business to be able to achieve its priorities. So, you know, that's another way that we were able to adapt and show that we were agile within our learning and organization. Once again, also demonstrating why it was really important to be friends with the finance people. Um, Where five, you think you're really agile. And once again, we can think of the pandemic, you know, you were able to quickly move and keep things up and running and get people you know, trained and continue to engage them or, you know, or one, you know, really, really struggled, canceled most of our learning, put it on hold, you know, haven't been able to really to be agile as at least as if, um, as we would have wanted to be. Let's get our last votes in. Super. Oh, this looks a little bit more like your the results of the holistic learning. So this is this is quite good. So we've got you know about a third of you um, that are above average and thinking that you're doing well. Like a good group in the middle, a third you know that think you know we're we're doing okay, and a third where you feel like you know there's there's room for improvement. Um, and once again, here, you know, in, in the agility space, I think, you know, you can look at any part of the learning value wheel and, you know, think about, okay, where could we really reinforce, um, and, you know, and become more agile in that area. Great. It's really been interesting to see where you are and overall the, the results are quite encouraging, I would say. So, let's go back to the presentation. So, you know, once again, in going back to the Harvard Business Review um, and the, the poll that they did, you know, to, learning and development, if you want to be a key lever and a key player in helping drive um, the organization's strategy, what's really, really important is, you know, your ability to demonstrate impact. Um, and, you know, that impact, it, it, it's not about the process. The process is important. You want, an, you want a smooth process. But it's being able to translate things back to the business in language that they understand. So to be able to um, to look at your learning, um, to be able to say, okay, here's the learning that your people are following. You know, here's how much of that is aligned to what they need today, to what they need to be developing for tomorrow. You know, here's how what we're putting in place. Now, I think, and you know, impact. Everyone has heard of the Kirkpatrick model. Um, I think, you know, that is something that's really good. I think you can think about how you adapt to that. 
Um, and, you know, once again, it's not about demonstrating impact at the same level on the Kirkpatrick model for everything. Um, yes, okay, are people happy with the learning? You know, that's the basis, you know, the, the feedback that they give. So are you collecting feedback? Do you know that they are happy with the learning experiences that you're that you're providing them. And that is important because people do need to be happy with that. Otherwise, you know, it, it's very hard to get people um, to, to join in. So this is where you need to be thinking about your participant experience, you know, as a customer experience. So, you know, are you able to make it attractive for them? Do they like it? Um, second level, you know, are are in some areas, is it important to test people to see, you know, that they've retained a certain level of knowledge, you know, how sometimes that is really important um, to be able to demonstrate that, you know, they've retained the knowledge that they've had, how much of it then goes to the third level, which is them, you know, actively showing how people have applied the learning back into their their workplace and that they're actually leveraging it in, in their day to day. And then how much of it actually goes to pull through to actually be able to demonstrate real business impact. And, you know, that is an investment that you make as well um, that, you know, you, when you want to demonstrate real business impact, you know, that is really closely linked between, you know, the learning and the business outcome, that is an investment is being made and it takes time and it takes effort so you want to be selective with what you do that with um so you know if you think as you go up to the Kirkpatrick model the more and more of an investment that involves and when you're putting into place learning solutions i always think it's really worthwhile to ask yourself you know what level of impact do we want to demonstrate with this you know maybe people being happy with it that's good enough <laughs> you really don't need any more um, other areas, you know, you do want to pull through and be able to demonstrate that, you know, the, the, the sales training that you've rolled out to the sales force, that the people that have followed it, you know, are now getting better results and that you can demonstrate to the business, you know, that this was a worthwhile investment that they've made. So asking, your, asking yourself when you're learning, you know, where do we want to invest to what to demonstrate what level of impact is important, and then being able to report that back to the business and to talk about that. And um, I think it's important because, I mean, this pulls through in different lever, levels. So, I mean, the more that learning can be seen as a real tool within the organization, the more it helps your employer branding. I mean, people join organizations because they want to learn and grow. I mean, that has been demonstrated over and over and over again. So if you've got great learning and development within your organization, that helps the overall employer brand. It, you know, it helps attract people that want to come into your organization. But I also think awards and recognition are really important. And they are really important because when you go for awards and recognition, what they're basically looking for is can you demonstrate impact? I mean, that is what almost all, all awards and recognitions are asking you to be able to demonstrate that impact that you've been able to have through whatever learning and development um, solution you've put into place. And that awards and recognitions, I've always used this, you know, to actually drive further recognition within the organization. So, you know, it's, first of all, you know, real skeptics in the organization, they're never happy with things that are inside the organization. They always think that things that are external are better. Um, but you do have some people that are supporters and that will help you. And I think that, you know, part of getting an external recognition for something that you've done helps ease those skeptics that think, okay, maybe what we're doing inside is actually pretty good um, because it's actually being recognized outside. So it's using those external awards and recognitions to actually drive and reinforce the recognition that you can have 
internally. So I think that's also a really important part. We're really positive. Again, you know, we're able to demonstrate impact in some key programs. You know, this gets business support and business recognition to one where, you know, we we're really struggling and business it doesn't probably see learning as being aligned to, you know, as a tool that they would use to help them execute their business strategy. Okay, should we get the last votes in? And here we go. Okay, <laughs> funny, this looks a lot like the results that we had for the digital question. <laughs> we seem to go back and forth. So, you know, 18% of you think that you're doing a fairly good job on demonstrating is that 42%, so quite solid, and they're in the middle, quite, quite solid middle, think that you're doing an okay job. Um, and, you know, 40% of you think that you've got room for improvement here. Um, and I think, you know, did, I, I think you know, the, the news I would give here is that, you know, is when you really, really, really want to start shifting, you know, the, the, the view that people have of learning and development within the organization, you know, your ability to demonstrate impact is the area that will carry you the furthest. And, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect everywhere, as I said, but if you can get a couple of the key examples that you can really focus in and make the effort to really look at how will we measure impact on this and how can we report it back to the business, closer that area is linked to an important business objective or goal that the organization or the business area has, the further it will get you. Um, and so you don't need to start with all your learning and development, but you can really zoom in on a couple of, of key things. And, you know, once again, the good news out there is that there are people in the business that are real supporters of learning. So, you know, look for those people and look to see how you can ally yourself um, with them and have them, you know, help you be able to demonstrate this. So, go back to the presentation now. Um, this is just to give you an insight um, into the framework. As I said, that the ESMD um, is an international organization and they do the um, de dedicated to the you know, building of management development capabilities through both business schools and in corporate learning as well. This is actually the framework that they have put into place and that I worked with them on last year to completely refresh um, that looks at, you know, what are all the different areas within the learning value chain that you would need to think through to make sure that um, you had a really, really robust L&D. Um, and so this is the framework that is then used for those accreditations. Um, so when, and the, the behind here, there's a lot more detail. There's like key questions to ask yourself. So you can think, have we thought through all of these different areas? Um, you know, in strategy, it's around the mission, the governance, and the positioning of learning. Um, while in, you know, resources, if we go to that, it's, it's really looking at, you know, what's the structure that you have in place? You know, what it, who are the team, you know, the team that you actually have in place? And then how do you actually use partners? So this idea of, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a whole ecosystem that you have in place. And I think that's even more important um, these days is it's not about trying to have all the capabilities within the team, but it's about creating that ecosystem that allows you to, to, to develop, you know, your offer and deploy that to your target markets. Um, and, you know, even go back on the impact side, it's about not just the measurement part, but it's um, how did that impact in, um, looked at 
within the organizational level. So things such as, you know, the internal brand, the employer image, um, do you have impact that's positive on other corporate functions? And, you know, if you're really advanced, we're even pushing people to think about, you know, what is the impact that they have on a societal basis? So how does learning help, you know, corporate social responsibility? And I think there, um, I mean, you had a, a great program that I know Santander of the bank in Spain has in place where, you know, actually, you know, one of the things that they've put into place is helping entrepreneurs in Spain learn English so that they can better, you know, position their businesses in the international market. And I think that's a great, you know, example of how they've actually used their learning function um, to, you know, help customers you know, be able to extend and and grow their businesses and create a more, you know, solid and robust local economy. So, you know, the impact all the way through to society. Um, so, you know, once again, this is a very complete framework. Um, the it, 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 I found it really helpful in all of the corporate learning jobs I've had. I've always used this framework to develop my, well, to think through where I am and then to be able to actually develop my roadmap. Um, and as I said, the good news is you can, you can start anywhere. Um, so just wanted to share this with you so you have an idea of, of what it looks like. Um, and then, you know, just to recap, so if, if you really want to have a learning strategy that's linked to your organization strategy and, you know, to be able to you know, build the agility that you need, you know, you need to focus on business outcomes. So it's not just focusing on the process, but, you know, really looking at what are the business outcomes that we're helping um, to achieve. You know, want to you want to reassure or work on aligning it to your organization's people processes. Um, so you know, it, it's great to have a formal learning offer in place, but you know, how is learning being promoted through you know, the the talent reviews or the the performance reviews that take place within the organization? Um, you want to ensure that you're building your own learning value chain and that you're focusing on how digital and agile help you, you know, reinforce that learning value chain. And then finally, you know, you want to be able to demonstrate data driven impact and outcomes to the business and the organization externally. Um, once again, that, that external recognition then helping you to then, you know, give a little booster or turbo back into the learning value wheel to you know, demonstrate the ability that learning has to support the business.